Hi YouTube, my name is Tyler. Uh, it is actually March 31st uh, and I'm just recording an intro now because apparently I did not record one when I started this vlog. So this is my final week in April reading vlog. Um, it takes place from the 21st to the 31st. Uh, so a little bit longer than a week, but usually my last week vlogs are just because there are extra days in a month. <laughs> so here are the things I read this week. Hello, it is March 24th and I am officially DNFing outlawed. I don't know, it's just gotten very boring, especially now that she has joined the hole in the wall gang. Um, with like a bunch of other women who are barren um and it's just gotten very westerny in a way that I don't enjoy. I don't like having all these new characters that I like honestly cannot tell apart from one another except for the kid. Um, the rest of them are like interchangeable to me. Uh, like they have not been very well described or differentiated in my opinion. Um, and then I read like this section, I read more past this but I highlighted it because it really stuck out to me when I read it. Um, they had stolen a cow and the cow ended up um, being separated from her calf and was very upset because she needed to be milked. The narration says, I pressed the cooling rags to the cow's udder one more time. Her moaning was a quiet lowing now. This cow was more woman than I would ever be. Um, yikes. <laughs> um, like, you do not need to have children to be a woman. Um, you do not need to be pregnant or give birth to be a woman. You do not need to breastfeed children to be a woman. Um, and like, it'd be one thing if like, she was thinking these things, but also like challenging these notions of like, society has told me I need to be a mother, but I'm infertile. Um, or I'm unable to get pregnant for whatever reason. Um, and so she's like, I feel less womanly, but it has opened my eyes to the ways of the patriarchy or like learning how to embrace her womanhood without this. And like, I just don't feel like I'm getting that critique that Yeah, critique, like, I'm just not getting that from this book. I'm really not. And I just am not enjoying it. I'm just not. I'm not enjoying the Western vibe and I'm not enjoying it uh, in conjunction with this, like, infertility deal. Uh, especially because I just don't feel like it's examining the problematic aspects. Like, I know that they're problematic, but I don't feel like they're being examined for the problematicness within the text. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm letting it go. Um, I paid for it, but I'm done with it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I did check out the second Poppy War book from the library yesterday, so I might start that today. But I am also listening to an audiobook and I have an ebook that I'm working on, so I might just go back and forth between those two books today and then start, uh, what is it, Dragon Empire, uh, Dragon Republic uh, tomorrow? Um, although tomorrow is Saturday. I don't know. I don't know what my reading is looking like, but those are the kind of the things I'm juggling at this moment in time. I should turn on the light. Howdy. It is, what day is it? March 26th and I just finished listening to Junk Science and the American Criminal Justice System by M. Chris Fabricant. Um, this is a book by a Innocence Project lawyer, um, a defense lawyer, 
who has spent a lot of time working to free innocent people from prison. Um, and this is a look at forensic slash junk sciences that are used in the criminal justice system in America. Um, this mostly, like the main focus is on bite mark uh, analysis, which is definitely like some of the shadiest, most fraudulent shit that was ever allowed to be used in courts. Um, but it also touches on some other things like um, blood splatter analysis, uh, arson, fire investigation stuff that was proven not scientific or correct. Um, some other stuff too uh, that I briefly on like hair and fiber analysis. Um, so yeah, things, things of that nature, forensic sciences. Uh, but the main focus was on bite marks. Um, and I, I believe that's because this lawyer, like that is his kind of his area of expertise. There are a couple different cases that are covered throughout the book. Um, some are like within a chapter, but some carry on throughout the book. Um, so you hear about a couple different cases um, at different points throughout the book, um, how bite mark evidence was used against them. Um, it talks about how, I think the most infuriating thing to me personally was how in the criminal justice system, finality is um, valued more than innocence. So uh, it takes a lot to overturn a jury verdict uh, because a jury verdict is final and um, that finality is like the end all be all. Um, so it doesn't matter <laughs> if there is a potential for innocence. Um, sometimes it doesn't even seem to matter if they are actually innocent. Um, you have to be able to find um, something legally that allows you to introduce this new evidence into a case that could potentially then prove innocence in court. But just the fact that they are innocent, you might have already done the testing um, and you're like, this person is innocent. Uh, this person could not have done what you said. Um, that does not matter to the court because they have already been found guilty. Um, and that's infuriating. Um, people have been executed knowing they are innocent. Um, there are people that have been executed that were probably innocent, but the criminal justice system refused to even do the testing to find out if they were innocent because this idea of finality and there needs to be an end of the road and people can't just constantly be um, testing new things and appealing and yada yada yada. Um, they want there to be an end point where all that ends basically um, and that's bullshit in my opinion. If someone is innocent they should not be in jail, uh, in prison. Uh, should not be on death row, uh, should not be executed by the state. Uh, <laughs> so that truly infuriated me. Just like in theory, I kind of knew that. I knew that like there needed to be a legal avenue um, to introduce new evidence, uh, but I did not quite realize that it was like legal precedent that like a verdict is final um, and that finality is what's important um, and how that finality is like used in arguments for not allowing uh, retesting of evidence and things of that nature. So that was pretty infuriating. Um, the other thing I will say is like I knew a lot of this was kind of uh, dubious. I've been skeptical of some of these things before, just having been aware of wrongful convictions. Uh, I had heard about some of the cases in this book that were talked about. I had seen the news about how um, hair and fiber evidence um, was not reliable um, and how the FBI, I think, um, used it recklessly uh, in the past. I remember that being big news I don't know, 
a while ago at this point, maybe almost a decade. Um, <laughs> so like I knew some of that, but the one that really truly blew my mind was, um, and it didn't get like super into it, uh, but fingerprint analysis. Uh, this is, you know, like the granddaddy of all forensic science. Um, and while, yeah, it can be used for identification in a similar way to the way dental records can be used to identify a body. So having a, um, a clean set of prints compared to like a clean set of, pr set of prints to match and be like, yes, this person is this person. Um, the way that it's used in uh, crime de <laughs> detecting, crime detecting, um, in what is it? the word I'm looking for. Um, detecting is like literally the only word that's coming to my mind. Uh, the way that it's used forensically in a crime scene uh, is not as accurate as you would be led to believe just by existing in American society. Um, which, you know, like as a person who is already relatively skeptical of like policing and prosecutors and like, uh, uh, and, you know, certain types of forensic science just by having the knowledge that I currently have. Um, that one really surprised me. I did not know that at all. Um, so, yeah, I mean, even <laughs> I'm still learning things. Isn't that amazing? You know, you realize that even being as like open minded as you are and holding the beliefs that I hold, there is still stuff you just absorb by being a person in, um, a society <laughs> uh, that just goes unexamined and you don't even realize that it's something that needs to be examined. Um, so yeah, uh, so I'm gonna give this a four star. It wasn't like the most amazing nonfiction book I've ever read, but I really enjoyed it. I would recommend it to people who, if you consume true crime content in some capacity, um, this would be something I would recommend you also listen to or read. Uh, Howdy there! It is March 28th. I usually would be closing out a vlog around now. However, it is the end of the month, so there are a couple extra days that don't fit into a week. Um, so obviously this vlog will be a little long, which honestly is probably a good thing. I've only recorded two clips for this vlog so far. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I read two things today. Um, I read Friday book one and Friday book two. Um, I've read this before. This is the second time I've read this. Um, I read this in December of 2021, I believe. Um, and it was the only one that was out at the time. Uh, I gave it four stars then. I gave it four stars again. I think the art in this is just like absolutely beautiful. Uh, look at this owl. Look at this house scene. I just think the art is so beautiful and that doesn't even include the snow. There, It's snowing throughout this comic and the snow scenes are just so lovely. I don't really want to do any spoilers so like the uh, cover for chapter one is snowy. Sorry this light is making it difficult to see. Anyways I just think the art is beautiful. Um, and I gave book two, also a four. Uh, my husband bought this for me last week, I think. It came in the mail. Um, and I wanted to read it, but I couldn't remember what happened in book one since it had been a while since I read it. So I read both of these today. Um, like I said, also four stars. Uh, this series is about a girl named Friday. Uh, she, it's like in the 70s. And she's coming home for Christmas from college. She is a freshman in college. Um, and as soon as she gets off the train, she is immediately kind of, uh, picked up and sidetracked by her friend, Lancelot. And you learn that Lancelot is kind of a little boy genius detective. And him and Friday are good friends and they work on cases with the detective in town, or the sheriff in town. And they have a case, and so when they pick up Friday, uh, they immediately go to try and figure out uh, or solve this case. They're trying to capture a guy who has gone kind of wild uh, after finding a mystical dagger. Um, and this sets off 
a whole cascading of set of events. Um, and by book two, um, it's just Friday on her own trying to figure out something that happened in book one. Um, and I just really enjoy it. I think the art is just, I, I, I just cannot explain how much I love the art. Like, I just find the coloring to be so beautiful. It's like so, ah, I don't know. I just, I just really love the vibe of the art of this series. I'm intrigued by the story. It's gotten more like supernatural and mystical. Um, like there was a little touch of it in book one. Um, and then there's like one big event that happens and you're like, oh, interesting. What's going on in this town? And then it like really kicks it up a notch. Um, with the supernatural magical stuff in book two but in a way that is really enjoyable to me I really like the 1970s vibe there is a cliffhanger at the end of book two that I am very excited about um man I just I'm really truly enjoying this I love Friday's whole vibe I love the way she's drawn let's see if I can find a some Friday art um Actually, you know, I think there's some character design. Yeah, there's some character design of Friday in the back of book one. Um, she has red hair in these glasses and her whole vibe is just very good. I like her a lot. Um, and there's a dance she goes to that they show in her, because it's in the 70s, her bright yellow pantsuit is just incredible. Um, yeah. I really enjoyed this series. They describe it as a genre-defying post-YA masterpiece. If that sounds intriguing to you at all, I really would recommend it. Um, it's kind of supernatural, mystical vibes, magical, um, but it's very grounded in reality. I think the characters are great. I cannot stop raving about the art. Um, I just think the art is just absolutely beautiful. Um, why it's not a five? I couldn't tell you why it's not a five. Uh, I don't know. It just, <laughs> it's just a four and it's a really strong, beautiful, great four. <laughs> Before I go, I forgot. Um, I'm not going to go through all the books that I'm still reading because this vlog is not technically over, but I did start listening to The Metamorphosis by Fran, Fran, Franz Kafka. What's his name? <laughs> Franz Kafka. Yeah. Um, a man turns into a beetle. Uh, it's pretty short. Uh, I listened to like a half an hour of it yesterday. Um, I probably won't finish today, although I don't have hockey, so it's possible I could finish it today. Um, but I do plan on finishing that at least uh, before the end of this vlog. And that might be the only other thing I finish this week. So I thought I would mention it. Um, it's interesting and weird. Um, I did not realize quite how old it was when I started it, but like, that was only because I went to add it on currently reading to Goodreads and I was like, oh my god, that's the publishing date? I had no idea. Um, because the reading, like the audiobook, I would, never would have guessed it was so old. So <laughs> anyways, that is that. I will talk to y'all later. Bye. Greetings. It is March 29th and I just finished listening to The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. You know, I actually enjoyed this quite a bit. Um, it wasn't quite a four for me. Uh, maybe that was listening to it instead of reading it. It's not very long, so maybe I should have just read it. Um, but you know, I actually liked the audio narrator that I listened to. I found a version of it on YouTube by LibriVox. Um, it was narrated by a British guy and uh, his narration was really enjoyable. I liked it. <laughs> I can't say that I like have some grand uh, metaphoric literary uh, understanding of this story, uh, but it was pretty enjoyable. Uh, wasn't quite a four for me, but um, definitely not a three. So it was probably more like a three, seven, five. Um, so I have no problem rounding it up on Goodreads. Uh, I'm gonna put it as a three and a half just because I don't like to get uh, more granular than that when I rate stuff. Um, but it 
it was probably like a 3.75. Um, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, the narrator I enjoyed. Uh, I really don't know <laughs> what to say about this. I mean, a man turns into a giant bug uh, and you are hearing his thoughts as like everyone around him is um, freaking out and uh, what his thoughts are about how they are dealing with the situation. Um, and the ending honestly was kind of depressing. <laughs> um, it's not a very long story so like if I get too in depth in detail it would spoil it but also it was published in like 1910 or something so like <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't really know what the um, time limit on spoilers are and whether this is a thing people would care if you spoiled it or not. Um, but I enjoyed it. Um, apparently there is some like differences of opinion on like translation and stuff. So I have no idea if this was a good or a bad translation. Um, I found it to be very listenable. Um, I believe it's like the most recent translation of it. So that probably contributes to how I didn't realize it was um, such an old work until I had added it on uh, my currently reading on Goodreads um, is probably translated to sound more modern to the English ear. Anyways, so like I don't have a whole lot to say. I did enjoy it. Um, I might read some other stuff maybe. I don't really know. I did read that like when he died he was very like he wasn't well known when he was alive. Like, his works. Um, and when he died his friend like published a whole bunch of his unfinished work um, that he purposefully asked <laughs> to be uh destroyed um and I, I genuinely I don't know how I feel about that situation um and so he became famous after death and became a literary icon after death um he never saw all this fame um and accolades um so like I'm intrigued to read more but I'm also kind of like I don't know it just it, it's weird to me when <laughs> uh stuff gets published or like against a person's wishes um but also I recognize like everyone involved in it is dead at this point <laughs> um you know like I don't know if I really need to have like a moral standing on this situation but it just feels weird to me and maybe that's just like my own hang-ups around like uh, death oh yeah I don't know those are some thoughts I have. Uh, I don't have any plans to read anything else like right this second but I would not discount it. Um, yeah so I'll probably see you in two days as I like close out this vlog because um, yeah I'm while I'm working on other stuff it's all long stuff that I haven't made a lot of progress on so <laughs> I will talk to y'all later. Bye. Hello, it is March 31st and I have finished a book and I'm going to close out this vlog. So I finished uh, Our Prisons Obsolete by Angela Y. Davis. Um, five stars. I listened to it in an audiobook. It's narrated by her. Um, it's so, so, so excellent. Um, it's a very short listen read. I think it's like just over 100 pages. It's about a five hour audiobook. Um, but I listened to it very quickly. Um, this is obviously about prisons so it dives into the history of prisons where they came from, the thinking behind moving from a system of corporal punishment to a system of imprisoning people. Um, talks about the history of it, its connections to uh, slavery and racism in America, um, its connections to capitalism, global capitalism, the prison industrial complex. Um, those last two chapters, so the chapter on like the capitalist implications of the prison industrial complex was just so excellent. Um, and then the final chapter dives into imagining what could replace prisons because I've so often asked of prison abolitionist um 
if we don't have prisons, what would we do with the bad guys? And so that's what that last chapter really dives into and tackles, um, which was just so excellent. Um, I wrote a few quotes, but since I listened to an audiobook, it ended up being a little bit too much of a hassle for me to write down all the things that really hit me. Um, but some, some of them are, the prison is considered so natural, it is impossible to imagine life without it. Um, which I feel like that's very much where that question comes from. People asking, well, what would we do with the bad guys? And it feels so ingrained in society that like it's impossible to imagine life outside of it. Okay, Max, we'll jump up here then. So there is that. Um, another quote was, why are people so quick to assume that locking away an increasingly large proportion of the U.S. population would help those who live in the free world feel safer and more secure? And then there was um, a little bit that I excised. What's the word I'm looking for? I have some an ellipsis in here. Why do prisons tend to make people think that their own rights and liberties are more secure than they would be? if prisons did not exist, which again was just another quote that like, woo, really hit me. And then there was one that I didn't get the exact quote, but kind of talks about how um, undesirable actions by men is often uh, seen or understood as criminal behavior, while uh, undesirable uh, activities, behaviors by women is often seen as like mental illness or insanity. And it was talking about how um, typically a lot of, or mostly women are uh, locked up in mental institutions and how uh, mental institutions can be seen kind of as operating in tandem with the prison system. Um, even though like in the last couple decades, we've seen a like marked increase of imprisoning of women, especially black women, especially in the United States. Um, so like, it's not like, exclusive to imprisoning women, but historically, that's typically how we have dealt with um, women who do not conform to society or what we want women to be doing is uh, we, <laughs> we blame their brains. Like they are obviously ill, <laughs> um, which is, interesting. So those were the three quotes that I kind of wrote down. Um, I really liked it. Five stars. Um, I really truly recommend you listen to it or read it. Um, I, I put off reading, listening to this for so long because I was afraid it was going to be like so dense and complicated and it just really was not. It was not dense. It was not complicated. It was very easy to understand. It's probably one of the um, best uh, non-fictions I have read on like uh, prisons and mass incarceration so um, not like I've read a ton of it but um, really truly enjoyed it a lot uh, highly recommend um, granted this was public like technically it was written in the early 2000s um, so uh, it's maybe just like a smidge dated on the like statistics but the arguments still hold up like they there we are still imprisoning lots and lots of people in the united states the arguments still hold water even if the numbers are technically different um so yes so that's the last book i read this week let's see how many books i read this week this cat is making it very difficult for me he is very needy apparently so hopefully I'm making sense because I feel like I'm getting distracted by having to attend to his needs. Uh, so let's see, one, two, three, four, five. I read five books this week. Uh, it was a long week, so uh, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. Uh, I am carrying over three things into uh, April slash next week. Uh, that will be The Impossible Community, still working on it, still moving very slowly. Now that is actual dense, like political, philosophical thought, uh, theory. Um, man, I'm going to be reading this book for the rest of eternity. It feels like, um, I really want to give up, but like, <laughs> I've just committed myself to it at this point. Um, let's see. Slonum Woods 9. I'm like, 
third of the way through it. Um, it's going slowly. It's still interesting, but um, it's kind of taking the back seat to the other book I am carrying over, which is the Dragon... I wrote Dragon Empire, but it's called the Dragon Republic, I'm pretty sure. Um, <laughs> the second Poppy War book. Um, I'm also moving very slowly through this, but it's just such a big book that like, I feel like I haven't gotten very far, but like I'm 200 pages in. So um, yeah, I don't know. I've just felt very uh, slow in all of my actual reading this week. So uh, yeah, that's this vlog, which you'll be seeing after my wrap up. Um, I will see y'all next week with, I don't know, a vlog probably. My April 1st vlog? I don't know. Um, I have not, I wanted to try and do like content planning um, and I haven't been doing it. So <laughs> anyways, I will talk to y'all later. Bye!